Well, welcome everyone. My name is Michael Walkup. I'm the Artistic Director of Page 73, and I'm very happy to be joined tonight by Kari Ullman, who is the Associate Producer at Page 73, and Mike and Holmquist, who is the 2023 Page 73 Playwriting Fellow and member of I-73. Um, I did quickly glance at my computer calendar to make sure I was about to say the right year. Uh, you'd think by April we'd be there. So, so tonight, the goal of this info session is to help any playwright who's interested in applying for page 73's 2024 fellowship or Interstate 73, just to know, just to try to be transparent and, and get really in the weeds about how our application works so that you can feel really prepared. Um, the application is the primary way that page 73 meets playwrights every year. Many, many of the productions that page 73 has produced are of plays that we got to know either through our application process or we got to know the playwright through our application process and stayed with them through a few plays until we landed on, you know, oh, that's the one we got to do. Um, so this application is really, really like the lifeblood. It is the, you know, submission procedure. Other than this, there really isn't um, a direct way to put your work in front of us. So we also like to make it accessible, free, and um, easy for anyone to apply because we want to get to know your work. So um, a couple eligibility uh, things to note about applying for Page 73's Fellowship and Page 73's Interstate 73 Writers Group, which are the two opportunities that are available to apply for. Um, we ask that all playwrights, of course, have to be within the mission of Page 73, and that mission is to support playwrights who have yet to have a professional off-Broadway premiere, which we define as a production that was produced on a full equity contract and ran for at least four weeks. Um, what you might think of as a traditional month or plus long off-Broadway premiere. If you have any questions about your eligibility, feel free to email us at info at page73.org and, and we'll, we can talk about it. Um, so anyone applying for our programs has to be within that mission, first and foremost. We also work with um, playwrights who are residing in the United States. You don't have to be a citizen, but uh, we work with playwrights who are making the American theater um, the home that they are writing plays for at the moment. Uh, we ask that you not apply if you are currently, uh, sorry, if you are going to be a full-time student um, in 2024 when the programs that you're applying for are running. And if you have any questions about that based on the program that you're in, you can also shoot us that email. And, you know, sometimes a question that will come up about eligibility is the idea of being so we talked about how you can be past our mission if you've had that off-Broadway professionally produced four-week run. Sometimes a question comes up about, can you be sort of too early or too green for page 73? And we think for these opportunities in a way, the answer is sort of yes. We've offered on our website the idea that you should have committed to playwriting as a professional career and written at least two full-length or three one-act plays. That can be slightly, you know, that's a lot of language and you might have your own take on what it means to commit to a professional career or the length of a play. But our idea, I think the idea behind that is page 73 serves playwrights, not just plays, meaning we're looking to work with a fellow and with members of the Interstate 73 writers group who are sort of full time playwrights. Um, in their in their pursuit in the in the art that they're pursuing more than I wrote a play I think someone should produce it um, or I think I'm going to start writing plays can I join your writers group so while we are proud to be a home for our early career playwrights there's a certain sort of um, professional approach and having gone to bat a few times as a playwright that we are looking for to be I would say the sort of lower end of our cutoff. And again, feel free to ask us any specific questions you might have about where you fit into that. So to quickly describe the two main programs you can apply for, because there's lots more information on our website, but the fellowship is an annual uh, single uh, award given out to one playwright. It comes with a cash stipend that is 
you know, helps in all the ways that cash in your pocket is meant to help of $10,000. And it comes with a development budget of $10,000 also, which is directed by the playwright in collaboration with me and Kari about how best to put the resources to further the writing of their plays. It's sort of that direct, that could be travel, that could be workshops, that could be um, you know, non-traditional development processes like involving a designer. The, you know, the, your imagination in a way is the limit plus the $10,000 budget. Um, we do separately from that also produce at least one public reading by the fellow every year. So you're always, the fellow is always gonna have that public reading separate and apart from what they choose to do with their own $10,000 development budget. And then of course their cash stipend. So note it's not enough money to not have a job entirely if that's how you're making ends meet. And it's not money for a production, it's money for developmental work. Those are two important things to note about the fellowship. And then Interstate 73 is our annual writers group. We meet from January to December. Kari and I select eight playwrights every year to meet around the table in our office in Fort Greene. That is a New York City based opportunity. You do need to be local and able to commute uh, Tuesday evenings to Fort Greene throughout the year. We usually take July and August off, um, but otherwise it's about every other week. I think it comes out to 20 sessions a year, 21, something like that. Um, we offer a $1,200 honorarium to every member in the group. We also provide lots of hospitality. The meetings typically go from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. They're very warm, they're very convivial. We either read new pages right around the table or a playwright has asked us to read in advance. Playwrights usually share the night. So there's you know plenty of time that an I-73 member is attending just to listen and participate in the feedback um, for the other playwrights as well. So, Mike and thank you for joining us. And one of the, I think, great resources in having you join us is that you can speak a bit to your own experience so far. And so I just thought I'd ask you generally, like, what your approach is, how you're using the fellowship and and how, how I-73 is going this year. Yeah, thank you for having me here. And um, yeah, I'm so happy to be the fellow this year and get to talk about this. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'm i so privileged that I get to be both in, have the fellowship and then also be in the I-73 group. And um, when I was doing my application, I, I emphasized how much, I think several times I wanted to be in the I-73 group because um, just being able to be in sort of communion with other playwrights and read their work and be inspired by each other is, um, so amazing and, and like such a rich part of the experience. Um, but yeah, so so far this year, what I've done, and I get to do these two things concurrently, so I'm sort of trying to see how they can like sort of intersect with each other. Um, so I've gotten to do a developmental reading. Um, we had five days in a um, in a rehearsal room getting to work on a play that I wrote, and then we did two public readings at the end of that. Um, and then I'm taking the information I sort of gathered from um, that experience and I'm revising that play and then using I-73 as an opportunity to give me a deadline. So my pages go up in a couple of weeks. So um, I'm, I'm using that as a sort of deadline to be able to bring that in. Um, but then also just get to give uh, my pages over to an incredible group of um, playwrights to get some feedback and get some general impressions of, of where it is and where it needs to go next. Um, so yeah, that's, that's been, that's been the year so far for me. I, that's helpful. Yeah, very much. And you made me think of a detail about I-73 that I think helps someone sort of get a sense of how we do it. There's a lot of writers groups out there. Um, but because so we have we're very proud of our you know our iPad readers that we're not printing paper and wasting it um but the other upshot of that is writers are often really working up till you know 5 p.m when they gotta hop on the subway or whatever and sending us that file that we're putting right on to the readers and it gives this I always feel because Kari and I if I didn't make this clear Kari and I sit in on all and sort of help manage I-73 although it really is a collective of folks talking to each other. But anyways, it gives, I always feel this great privilege of you're experiencing a writer's like truly like newest, freshest thoughts a lot of the time. And that's a very privileged place to get to, 
to be in community together. And then on the flip side, sometimes we've absolutely had I-73 writers come to like dust something off that they are like, uh, there might be cobwebs on this. I haven't wanted to look at it in so long, but now that I have this group, you know, I'd like to do that. Do you, Mike, and have a sense of how what you might be turning your attention to after you meet this deadline? You said a few weeks. I think it's next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Next. It's a week from tomorrow. Um, I, yeah, I think I I'm sort of using it for both. So I'm doing these revisions. So that's a project that I I have um, been sort of inside of for a long time. But then I'm also writing a new play this year. Um, and so the first time I brought pages, it was very like raw, fresh pages that I never heard aloud before. And um, and it was lovely because the the group read the pages out loud. So I just got a very quick sense of like what these even sound like. And then also just gave me um, some really valuable feedback um, about, you know, sort of what's working and what's like really resonating and things like that. So, so yeah, sort of, sort of both have been my experience already of sort of like very fresh pages and very um, sort of, yeah, dusting off pages. That's great. Um, okay, well, we'll probably be having more chance to talk about your work, Mike, and one of the main goals of this info session is to get really nitty gritty about the application itself. So Kari, I'm gonna hand the Zoom baton to you. Great. Thank you, Michael. And I am actually just going to share my screen so we can all look at the application together, go through it together, demystify it as needed. So give me just a sec. All right. Are we looking at the application, Michael and Mike? In? Yes, you got it. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So we are just going to go through this drop down menu, check in on all the points. Michael, Mike, and I may offer commentary as needed as we go through. So let's start at, we'll start at the top. This year's deadline is April 23rd at midnight. So the application will close then. Please plan your time accordingly. We know that all of our playwrights love to submit those at the last possible minute. So we look forward to that great influx of applications on the 22nd and the 23rd. Programs overview. This is what Michael just walked you through, the details of the fellowship and the Interstate 73 Writers Group. And this and the note here also worth pointing out that while the fellow and the majority of I-73 writers are come to us through this application every so often, an I-73 writer will come to us through another channel, whether they've done it before in the past and we think it would be a good opportunity for them to do it again, or they've magically reached us from beyond the application. It does happen every once in a while. But the fellow very explicitly must apply that that's a, yes. that's a for sure. Uh-oh. Here we go. And these are the eligibility requirements that Michael also walked you through a moment ago. Um, anything worth commenting on here? We're also happy to answer your questions later yeah, on. We, I, yeah, I'm anticipating one question about I-73 is sometimes we get tri-state area questions. And our answer is, is usually just like, it's very important that you're in Fort Greene till 10 p.m. on a Tuesday. And so in my world, that would mean I would have to live in the city and be able to take a subway home. Others have, you know, talked to us about their ability to travel. We could talk about it if you're if you're in a sort of a liminal, like close to the city space, but it it, it really is meant to be the local opportunity, which is also worth me saying that I didn't say earlier, the fellow does not have to be based in New York. The fellow can be based uh, anywhere in the U.S. And timeline for notifying applicants. So we're back to our usual application schedule after some disruptions during pandemic lockdown years. So once the application closes, they will be read by um, dramaturgs, directors, people of the theater who um, come to us through Beehive Dramaturgy Studio. So they will go through several rounds of evaluation that way. 
And then um, semifinalists will be announced in early fall, finalists in December, and the fellow is selected at the very end of the year and announced in the new year. We typically start building the new I-73 group over the course of the fall months. And submission procedure, by this form only, let us know if you have any issues with it. It does glitch every so often. And okay, materials. So you have to use this form. It does not auto save for you. So have your PDFs ready to upload. And then we do want to spend a minute on this component, the letter of intent, which we consider to be one of the most important aspects of our of our application because this is your chance to introduce yourself to us beyond beyond your resume and to contextualize your work for us. Um, and this is also a great opportunity for an applicant to demonstrate their own self awareness for where they are at in their career and what they need in. I suppose I'd say we aren't so much looking for, you know, incredible artistic manifestos or statements of the meaning of art or anything like that, as beautiful as those can be. We are really looking for sort of a self aware reflection on where the playwright is and what they need and how they think page 73 can meet them at that point. Michael, do you yeah. want to elaborate? I often think of it the way that, you know, we're a nonprofit theater company, which means we spend a good amount of our life writing grants to philanthropies. And it's essentially this a similar dynamic in, in only the best way, which is to say, we have some resources, we don't have them for everyone, and we really want to give them to not just a person we think is talented, because so many, so many playwrights we think are talented, but a person who really speaks to like, I can use these resources in this year to make this impact on my artistic and professional career. That's the winning argument um, time and time again for the fellow and for I-73. It's, it's not just a writing competition. It's not just a Michael and Kari's favorite um, line of dialogue competition. It, of course, we have to respond to your writing. But again, we respond to many, many people's writings. We're looking to this letter of intent to really help us say they they need this writers group next year like this is this is how this is going to help i remember that exact comment actually about mike and when we were talking about reading her application and how um it would just be a, she she pointed out to us very clearly how the resource of the writers group would be a great resource in 2023 and that really connected with us and then finally, I'll just add, someone pointed out recently to me, 750 words is actually kind of a lot. <laughs> we were putting that there to try to suggest like, you know, concision is great also. So uh, maybe like, it doesn't like have to be 750 words, but do make sure you answer those three questions in the course of your letter, because the evaluators that we work with, Kari and I read like the top, I don't know, 20, 25% of applications. But the first round are dramaturgs, directors, playwrights who we know. They are asked to literally gave it a marking of did they answer the questions or did they not answer the questions? So as you review your letter and you've got your personal sort of story in there, maybe you've dashed in some manifesto. Uh, after all, just make sure that one, two, and three are clearly addressed and perhaps even just in bullet point form, you know, just really make sure they're there because that's a direct. That's something we're really looking for. Yes, thank you, Michael. And after that, we're just looking at the, the script sample. So that is a full length script and then a 10 page excerpt of that same script. That's very important. They can't be from two different works. It's a 10 page excerpt approximately of your full length play that you are submitting. And we can uh, and we can get into that later during the question session about the best way to choose a sample, all of that. But that is the requirement to note there. And 
Finally, this is the application form itself where you will enter, you will enter your information. And Wait, we should pause on that button. one. Wait, Kari, go back to that. Um, oh, the new one, the new question. This is new. If, if you're a repeat applicant, you will find this question new. Uh, it is optional. You'll see it doesn't have the red asterisk, so you can skip it if you want. We are trying to, so we acknowledge that reading 10 pages is, is not as great as reading a full length play. We are also a very small company. We are, um, we actually do pay a considerable amount of resources. It's very important. It's a priority that we have great readers and they get paid and all of that. That said, it's not full length plays in those initial rounds, not until later rounds would we be doing that. So we are trying to correct for that by acknowledging that, you know, people write in many, many different styles. Some of our favorite plays might look kind of odd in a 10 page sample. And so we just wanna give you just 50 words, if you want, contextualize the sample. Say, this is, you know, this, this form continues until the end when it switches over to something else. Or this is, this is, uh, it, it's a nonlinear play, and so you're getting 10 pages, which means they're nonlinear, but the whole play adds up to this or whatever. Like, honestly, however you want to use it, but help. It's it's we want to help you um, tell us about the work that we're about to approach, and tell our readers about the work they're about to approach on its own terms. We ask every reader to evaluate the writing on the terms that the writing and the playwright have set out for it, not on some sort of I don't even know what set of values, but not on an arbitrary set of values. Um, so this 50 words, I think, can, is meant to really help you let us into how you're seeing this play and how it works. And that is the application. So I'm going to stop the screen share and bring us back. All right. So now that we've had a chance to go through the entire application and hear about the different programs, uh, Mike, and it would be wonderful to hear from you about how you approached applying to our programs, both the fellowship and I-73, what your experience was at the application and all that. Yeah, it, it's um, interesting hearing you talk about it now in hindsight, because of course, when you're in the middle of it, you're sort of like, just reaching out, trying to do, say the thing you want to say or whatever. But, um, but I do think that um, my approach, um, so I, I applied, I think, uh, three times in succession um, to get to this place. And um, each year, it was a lot, a lot of the application and um, approaching those specific questions that are on the letter of intent was about um, being quite honest, I think, about my needs. And I noticed that the more, the, the, the further I got into this application process, the more honest and authentic I sort of was about like what I needed and who I was. Um, and there, I had a sense early on when I very, very first started applying for developmental things as a young, young playwright, um, I sort of was like doing the thing where I was like really trying to figure out what I thought they wanted uh, from me, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I think that when I started applying for page 73, it was really about like being quite honest about like, like I'm, I'm a quite shy person. I'm very introverted. I, this is where I am in my career. Um, and the further I got into my career too, or my career, you know, whatever that means, but um, like the further I got into like trying to do this professionally, I think also the more I could contextualize easily just sort of where I was and what I was thinking and how I was sort of moving through this world and everything like that. Um, and then I also did try to add in some context about like, this is who I am, this is where I'm coming from. Um, you know, my, my plays are about this region because this is where I come, you know, trying trying to offer some um, artistic context in, in that regard as well. So um, yeah, did that answer the question? I hope it did. And I'll just add, and we already did talk about it, but you you did an important thing if you are choosing to apply for both programs, which we deeply encourage everyone to, is when we say, how would our resources help you with meet your challenges? You should do it for both because they're not the same resources. Um, and so how I-73 was, 
you know, sitting in community with something you're interested was separate and apart from the maybe the professional goals that the fellowship was offering you. And I think you outlined those well. Yeah, and I, I knew I really, really wanted to be part of I-73. So I, I, I remember that when I was working on it, I was like quite specific about being like, this is why I would like to be part of I-73. This is why I would like the fellowship and um, trying to delineate those things because I, I really, um, it, you know, if the fellowship had not worked out, I still really wanted to be part of I-73. So trying to like be very specific about those two things. Yeah, and that's an important point, too, that someone was asking me about the other day, that I-73 is in no way like a consolation prize or a runner-up to the fellowship in any way. It's a very different, separate resource that meets different needs. So we're hoping that when people are, you know, mean like continuing to express their interest in I-73 it's in a way that's separate from the fellowship because it's an ability you it lets you develop a different different skill set bring um participate in a different community all of that that's really great and it makes me think of a frequently asked question that now I'm going to sort of pivot us to questions from everyone so if you've joined us um, and you want to chat a question, you want to raise your hand, your Zoom hand, and, and we'll get around to calling on those folks. Um, uh, please, please do. This is your time also. But I we do have some FAQs that we'll start out with and can pepper in to keep it going or maybe spark some more from you all. And one of which is we've had people say, you know, I, I wonder if I am green, you brought up that green thing. So should I just apply for I-73? Maybe it's not time for the fellowship for me. And I think there could be an argument for that. Maybe someone has like that level of self-aware and they're trying to be self-aware because we're always saying that, which is important. Um, but in general, I also encourage you not to overly worry about, you know, you're not gonna seem, uh, out of touch to us because you check the box that says I also want the fellowship and you write a sentence about why the fellowship would further your art and career so so I don't want to encourage folks to talk themselves out of it um but I also like how Mike and pointed out that like knowing very clearly why a program like I-73 would serve you or knowing very clearly why the fellowship would serve you you should be able to answer both of those that should be your reason for applying for both, or if you really think you can't answer one of them, maybe not, but um, don't talk yourself out of checking the box for fellow, I would say. I think we've had a few folks sheepishly do that over the years, and then we've sort of been like, are you sure? Um, and, uh, I'm not seeing the chat. That's not going to help me know if people are asking questions. I've got the chat open. We're good, but while... Okay. While we wait for while we wait for any of you to jump in, however you'd like to jump in, um, we'll just do another question that we often get, which is, can I submit the same play as last year for the writing sample? And the answer is yes, but the encouragement we always give is yes, if the play has undergone, you know, substantial changes or rewrites, it's not just the identical draft that you submitted on a previous year, it's continued to grow and evolve with your writing because the closer your application is to, you know, reflection of your concerns, preoccupations, interests, aesthetics as a writer now, the better that will serve you as the application is evaluated. Um, I'm curious, Mike, and did you submit different plays with each value with each application, or uh, were there any updated drafts of old ones? If you can dig back into the mists of time to remember, I did. I did submit one of my plays twice, and but I I did do a pretty extensive revision between the two times, um, and so. So once I got to the finalist position, um, you all asked me for another play. And, and that, so I had resubmitted that, but I tried to have something new each cycle. Um, but then when the second play opportunity came up, I, I had, I resubmitted something. Does that make sense how I said that? Yeah, but it, it's pointing out to me that we didn't quite get into that. So why don't we, which is to say you fill out this application in a, by April 23rd. Um, semi-finalists, when they're notified in the fall, they're asked to update the full length they sent 
it might not have changed a ton. We're not saying it better have. We just want to make sure we have like the freshest draft and submit a second full length. So that's back to that green point. Like you're going to need to be a semi-finalist and to move forward, you're going to need to have that second, like also really good script ready to go. And then a finalist is going to be asked for even more writing and an interview. Um, an I-73 person would also be interviewed. Um, so there's like, we accumulate more reading and you get more personal time with us as the process goes on. Um, we are getting excellent questions um, and I'm going to just start going down the list. Um, to Sakari, uh, yeah, I actually think a libretto is maybe a good idea um, because it's it's not impossible that a reader would be listening to songs that you submit also, but I think, and we have supported musicals and we've had writers in our I-73 program um, who are musical writers also. Uh, but I think the libretto is something that can like clearly represent the story you're telling and like what you're interested in and, and your weirdness coming through is, is actually a really good idea for your sample. Um, and yeah, I think Kari answered your second question there, but absolutely a very much changed draft is very fair game. Um, a little nuance to add to that idea of what play to pick to submit is like, maybe you are working on something new, but you know it's not quite come together yet. Um, but you have a play from like the prior year or two that like, it still is you. It still feels like this is what I'm interested in. I would probably submit that one that you feel like is done and is you, at least in this first round. As you get along the way to semi or final, if that's a great time to be like, well, this is much newer and I don't have an ending. Um, I think not having an ending in the initial step is probably means the play is a little too fresh to be the best one for the application. Would you agree, Kari? Am I out on a limb here? You agree. Okay. All right. So that's my, there we go. Um, Kari, you want to take uh, uh, the question about professional artistic challenges? Yes, yes, gladly. The, how would we distinguish between professional and artistic challenges? Artistic challenges are the, you know, the very personal subjective things that you want to improve on in your work. Say you want to, like, get better at structure, you want to get better at sticking and ending, you want to start exploring this kind of theme or writing in this kind of mode. That That's sort of how we describe the sort of artistic challenges of are you, are you achieving the thing that you want to achieve with your art? Whereas the professional challenges are along the lines of, I feel like I don't have a network in New York City. I haven't been able to connect with other theaters. I have, maybe I don't have an agent yet. Sort of the things that live in that professional realm that obviously aren't disconnected from the art, but are perhaps more business-like and the things that page 73 could help you accomplish as, you know, a reputable off-Broadway theater with those connections. Does that feel accurate? Remember, yeah. Do you remember yours, Mike, and by any chance? What a put you on the spot kind of question. I, I do remember that my professional challenges were very much like, I'm really struggling with shyness. I'm really struggling with like meeting people. And, um, that I, I'm sort of struggling knowing, like I've sort of put these resources and things in place or like I've been vetted in these certain ways, but I, ha I can't get to a production level and I don't know how to. I think those are my two professional. I don't, I, I know I wrote about artistic challenges, but I'm having trouble remembering what that was now. Yeah, yeah, something I would say about that is I think every once in a while we get a response to the what are your artistic challenges that has a little tone of like, well, I'm a good writer. I'm doing the writing I want to do. And we're like not coming for that. That's not what we mean. We mean that every artist in every medium is like pursuing something like I'm trying to to put I, I want I want my plays to, you know, crack open character and to, you know, be done with Freud. Like that's a great artistic challenge if that's what you're doing. Like it doesn't have to be, I don't know how to format dialogue on my page. We're not talking, I'm not, we're in none of these are we asking you to put yourself in a 
oh, I don't know place, but like literally, what are you working on? What if if your if your answer to those questions is my plays are great and professionally I'm on fire, that's so awesome. And it's probably the best reason not to give you the fellowship because I don't know how our felt our resources would support you. Um okay. Uh, that was a little tangent, but tips on selecting a 10 page excerpt. Yes, absolutely. So for starters, dispelling the notion that they should automatically be the first 10 pages of your play. We hire really smart readers. Um, we now are giving you this tool of contextualizing like the style of the pages. You're also very welcome to add a stage direction that maybe doesn't exist in the real play, but brief, don't go overboard, but like at the top of the excerpt that's like, right before this, we learned this, that, and the other. Okay, moving on. Um, I think the 10 pages, so I'm going to use the like the form of realism as an example. With a lot of plays that are written in the realist style, the first 10 pages are sort of going to have a lot of exposition and a lot of slow build. That's that's just often the format or, or the, the form of that style. That is not going to necessarily be the best show of sort of what you're up to as a playwright, because you might sort of intentionally be being coy or withholding or um, underwritten in a way that if that stays the style throughout, then that's great. If what's to come is emotional explosions and as one of our old professors said, my problems in your living room and everyone is like yelling about everything, I think it might be a much stronger choice to show us you working on conflict than you working on exposition. That's just using the form of realism. If you're working on, in poetry, um, similarly, like as the themes develop in the writing and, and the, the, the language gets more complex, it might just be a better place to draw from. This is not to say the first 10 pages is never the right idea. They really might be, but um, don't de facto decide that they should be um, because it might leave us wanting more uh, in in not the right way. Uh, I think I think all of the ten page samples that are really good leave us wanting more. But um, that's why we have the full play attached. That as the stages of the reading go on, we can get to that. But yeah, don't be shy about adding a little quick description of of what's been happening before that. Um, and do we ask for character descriptions, Kari? I feel like I'm about to speak out of turn. We do now, and that doesn't count towards the 10 page limit. So I think a character description is great. I also usually say at this point, um, don't game the system by increasing the words per page, like either through weird formatting or um, choosing the big monologue just because it's more words that, that doesn't necessarily always actually end up benefiting you, I will say, um, yeah. All right, next up from Alex Webb. Kari, I'll give that one to you. All right. Or it, slash Mikan. Yes, this is also this is also a Mikan question whether her work was building in each way in each application in a it culminated, or if it was just the if it was just the last one that finally cinched it. Who? Mikan, what do you think? I mean, for me. For me, it felt like a culmination because I I applied multiple years in a row. And so I was trying to be really thoughtful about what I said last year, what I submitted last year, where I was this year. I don't I don't know how that how that was received on your end, but like from my end, I certainly was trying to think about just like um, you know, what what was I doing last year professionally that I could improve on this year and then be able to talk about and, you know, just things like that. And, um, and also hopefully show like, my writing continue to explore new things or or progress in certain ways. So um, for me, it felt like a, a culmination of, of like really thoughtfully trying to apply and learn your organization over several years. Yeah, that sounds that sounds right to me because it's also from where we're receiving applications, it's also where we can meet the playwright, like the right resources for the right person at the right time. And I would say that with Mikan's most recent application, both the you know, that with what she articulated in her LOI, but then also it just feeling like the right moment in Mikan's career for us to 
meet her with the resource of the fellowship and just give her that sort of moment that bump because she was ready to you know seize it and run with it yeah and fun stat for those who like stats in the last six fellows exactly three of them were first time applicants and three of them were third time applicants so do with do that, with that data, what but, you will <laughs> um, quickly to be clear you do not have to live in new york to apply for the fellowship that is correct patricia you can live anywhere in the states you have to be here if you're attending I if you're also applying for I-73. Um, the play you want, if if the play I want to use the fellowship funds for is not yet finished, can I submit a different finished full length? Yes, that is actually exactly what you should do. You can talk in your letter of intent about what you're pursuing right now and 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 how you'd like to keep pursuing it, but you you you're under no obligation to be sending us that play. In fact, as you're suggesting, if it's not finished, and what I was just saying earlier, that's probably not gonna be the best play to apply with. Um, so yes, absolutely, send us a play. Now, I think the one place where you can be really in a little bit of a pivot here is if you are a writer who has been like in one lane and you are busting out of that lane for the first time and you wanna tell us about that, that's exactly what your artistic challenge is. That's what your professional challenge is. And you want our support. You might want to send us a note and just ask about this. But like, it, that can be a little tricky. Because if your LOI is describing, you know, like disco pyrotechnics, but you're coming out of like quiet naturalism, and then your sample is quiet naturalism, that could be a bit off if you feel your pivot is that large. But that's not a very common thing. I feel like I'm it's not exactly a straw man because that has happened, but it's not the most common. In general, a play that you feel really represents what you're up to as a playwright that is finished um, is, is your strongest play to apply with. And then tell us with exciting language like what you're getting up to. Uh, okay. Next question. How many pages for I-73 meetings? You know, it really varies because everyone lays out their plays so differently these days, but in a standard meeting where two writers are sharing a night and they have both brought in pages to read around the table, I would say that for each writer, we read for about 45 minutes. So whatever page count that looks like to you, 40 to 50 pages, and then we talk as a group about them for another 25 minutes or so. So always, you know, adjust that for whatever your play looks like and sounds like, but that's an approximation that we fall back on. Um, and there's just a few more, and that's really great timing, I think. We'll we'll take a few more if you have them. Um, but here's one that is if you progress to the semifinalist stage and a second full when a second full length play is requested, can that be a play that's been produced regionally but not in equity production? Yes. And actually, to be clear, both of them could be. Uh, we are a New York centered theater company. We see the value of that career moment of a New York off-Broadway premiere. So we don't only produce world premieres. We don't only work with fellows who haven't had any premieres. You can be, we've, we've done it, like lots of productions, Cleveland, Kansas City, whatever. It just if that New York part of your production career hasn't happened for you, then you are in our mission. You can be a page 73 writer and you can absolutely submit um, that writing as your sample for both of those. I'm Kari, you take on Sukari's uh, parentheses question, but you have to read it out because I'm realizing when people watch it back, they want on the chat. I know I was thinking about the YouTube folks too. Um, do you secretly have a page count cap desired length for the full length work? And we really don't because it comes back to that layout thing where some somebody might send us a 50 page script and it's just dense with dialogue all the way through and someone else might send us a 200 page script where it's like three words on a line. So we're we and the writers we hire to help us with this process have gotten pretty nimble about how we respond and to you know take a play on its own terms. So we really don't have a secret cap anywhere. That goes nicely with this this last question that we have here in the chat. Um, 
which is for the early rounds of evaluating, does each application only get one reader looking at it and then recommending it pass or forward? Or is it multiple readers reviewing the same application? Um, it is multiple readers reviewing all applications. Um, we are gonna, every application is gonna start with two reads, then the majority of them are gonna get two more reads. And only at that point are Kari and I going to sort of start putting together with our train, you know, the readers that we hire through comments, through, you know, their evaluation of did they answer the questions in the LOI? Did they answer them in a way that drew me in and excited me? Whatever, we'll, get, we'll sort of tally that into the bell curve, take the top 20 percent say and that's when Kari and I give personal attention to every single application from that point forward all the way through semis finalist interviews and selecting the fellow I hope that answers that question for you Greg oh but the reason I was saying that dovetailed nicely with Sukari's question is that like the 10 page sample is its own sort of like application art form and on that Ground, everyone's sort of on equal footing. No one's going to be like, oh, this one's so long or this one's really short. So I liked it. And then it's our job as readers and as the readers we hire to like manage those biases. If someone sees a page count and they want to have a sigh about it, they need to stand up, take a stretch, have a glass of water and sit down and approach the work on its own terms. And we are really close with our readers. We, we trust that we are getting that level of professional um, approach to scripts. But it's it's also, I think, fine to acknowledge that stuff like that comes up um, and, and, and we really do try to manage all of that. Well, Mike and I wanna thank you so much. I think hearing from you uh, was really helpful. And wait, one question came in under the wire. Does it, oh, it was sort of about, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. Does it work? It's sort of about the scoring I was just talking about. Wait, so many other new places. Oh, oh, oh. No. Okay. So the question is, I'm just going to summarize this question. Mm -hmm. Is it working against you if you are sending the same play in that first round? Because even though you've worked on other plays, you really do think that one is your strong sample play. No, I think that's being smart. I think that's being smart about the application process. You have it's very likely the same readers wouldn't even be reading it that read it last time. Like we do work with people year in and year out, but sometimes a new person comes on, someone goes off. And just like of those four people who would read your app, it, you know, it could totally moosh around. So I don't think you have to worry about like someone going, nope, I've already done it. Um, as long as I think it's still your, like what you're up to now, it doesn't feel like some sort of prior era of your writing and, works well as a sample, that's probably your strongest. That that is that is a good one to send in, I would say. Anything to add to that, Kari? You with me on that? Totally. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we wrap this up by saying any further questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube later, please email info at page73.org. We'll try to get back to you promptly. Uh, we look forward to reading all of your applications. Uh, reminder, they're due again Sunday, April 23rd at 11, we say 11.59 p.m. So there's no confusion over what we mean. Um, and we can't wait. We, we love this every year. Thank you again, Mike. And yes, thank you, Mike. And, and we look forward to reading all of your applications. It's one of our favorite things that we do. And we mean that with great sincerity. We're not just getting lip service to it. We love this process and it's how we find our writers. So it means everything to us. So thank you for your interest. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Mike. And night. Thank you.